So I need you to turn somebody, turn to somebody beside you, mostly because this kind of stuff makes my wife uncomfortable, uh, and say, I've got heart problems. If the person sitting beside you happens to be one of our nurses, they are now legally obligated to start chest compressions. So uh, good luck with that. I had you say that because we are well into our heart problems series, talking about relationships of all different kinds. Um, sometimes... These are fun and easy conversations, and sometimes they're not. And I hope today falls kind of right in the middle for most of us. Um, but we are going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 18. And we're going to start at verse 21. Now, I warned you that this was coming, so I'll give you some time to get there, because that's what you're going to see. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Now, if you weren't here for that a couple of weeks ago, the reason that that's what you're going to see is because we all need to personally engage with the Word of God. When we do, it changes us in all kinds of different ways. And when your personal engagement with the Word of God is through a you know, nine-foot screen on the wall... It's not very personal. So we're trying to make it personal. So whether you use a paper Bible, whether you use an app, however you do it, I want to encourage you to get in the habit of bringing the word with you and reading it for yourself as I read through it. Now today, I'm going to be reading um, from one of three translations that I use pretty regularly. This one is CSB. Uh, that's Christian Standard Bible. Um, you also might see it listed out there in other places as HCSB, which is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. <laughs> but CSB is, is the short. Um, for those of you that are curious, you'll hear me read from this. You'll hear me read from another translation called the ESV. That's the English Standard Version. And quite often you'll hear me read from the New International Version, the NIV. Occasionally I'll throw some other crazy stuff in there. Might get really wild and read from King James every now and then. It's when you know it's really serious. But here's where we are today. We're in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, starting at verse 21. And this is what it says. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe! At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. 
so also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sisters from your heart. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for how it takes us to new depths of relationship with you and with each other. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak to our hearts and our minds now. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, wisdom for understanding today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I was a pretty good student in school. I even excelled at math, sort of. Early on, math was easy. Two plus two equals four. Four times two equals eight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then sometime around seventh grade, some wise guy thought it would be funny to mix up the numbers and the letters. And even still, I figured out these tricks, and I did well. They were on to me. And then they said, we'll show him, let's add shapes. By the end of my high school career, I was no longer a very good math student because we were daily solving something called a matrix, and the answer was there is no spoon. Now all my nerds are officially with me now. My brain was mush. This stuff didn't make any sense. And I came to the very real conclusion that like the title of today's message, math is hard. But as I read the beginning of this passage of scripture, I found myself wondering why Jesus would answer what seems like a fairly simple question with a math problem. So many people will interject that numbers that are referenced here are often used to represent completion or perfection. And that Jesus was making a statement about our need to continually offer forgiveness until we have all reached a state of completion or perfection. Which is a really simple way of looking at this. But I don't believe that we should just slough this off so quickly. Oh, everybody's going to mess up. I am, you are, we all are. So let's just remember to forgive and forget and move on with life. Well, hold on a minute. Before we get too caught up in the 70 times 7 and running the numbers, I want to look at the latter part of this passage. So go to verse 23. It says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. And since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. So let's be real clear here. The king was owed this money. He had every right, and especially as the king, to demand repayment. He also had every right to bring the hammer down exactly the way that he did on this servant. And, again, he was the king, so who's going to argue with him? But now let's start getting to the heart of this. We're not talking about money today. We're talking about forgiveness and these few verses give us the first glimpse of the idea of accountability. The servant was indebted to the king. The king calling for repayment was simply the servant being held accountable to his part of that relationship. Which brings me to the first reason why forgiveness can be hard. People don't want to be held accountable. Too many people, in fact, have the idea that I can say what I want to whoever I want because my emotions are real. My feelings have value. Yeah, your feelings do have value, but so do everybody else's. And then you'll argue, I can't be held responsible for how other people react to what I say. 
And I don't know why you talk like that, but that's how you say it. <laughs> and you know what? You're right again. But you also have to be accountable for the words that you let come out of your mouth. And that's not just me. That's the word of God. Take a look at Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45. It says, a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or grapes picked from a bramble bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. If the stuff that's coming out of your mouth is ugly, the stuff inside you is more than likely ugly. But that's not the only scripture that talks about this. Take a look at James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. With the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Oh, but unfortunately, they are all too often. So these passages exclusively are really addressing words, but I want you to understand that this applies to your attitudes, your actions, and behaviors as well. And you might not want to be held accountable, but one day you will be. One day you will be. So the second reason why forgiveness can be hard, people don't want to be confrontational. Now, nobody likes conflict, I get it. I don't, I, I don't enjoy it. I don't like having to have hard conversations and, and dealing with messed up behaviors. A lot of people, though, get the idea that, of course, with conflict comes some level of anger and that anger is somehow a sin. It's not. So if, if you're one of those people that for some reason has been living this deluded existence that you can't ever be angry as a follower of Christ, here's some freedom today. Get angry. But do not sin. I want you to take a look at John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture because it gives us some great insight if we just spend a little bit of time on it as to how Jesus handled anger. John chapter 2, 13 through 16. The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves. And he also found the money changers sitting there. Understand that there is a significant pause in time between verse 14 and 15. Because Jesus finds all these people sitting there. And then verse 15 says, after making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. It doesn't get much more confrontational than that. Chances are you won't be chased out of life song by someone wielding a whip. 
it's a possibility. I'm not going to lie. We've, there's you know, a certain level of crazy that we like to maintain around here. So I don't make any promises about that not happening to you. But what I do promise is that if you're struggling with this idea of, well, I can't love people and get angry, well, here's, here's your freedom because Jesus, I promise you, when he looked at all of those people who had gathered in the temple and were doing all of these things that the temple wasn't intended to house, he looked on them with love. He loved them. I know that because Christ died once for all and they were part of all. So his self-sacrifice and atonement was for them just like it is for us. But he still got mad. The best part, though, is that he took some time to think about how mad he really was. And he sat down and wove a whip. I know that we have some ladies in the house today that knit or crochet or, or craft stuff like that. It takes time to do even the simplest craft like that. If you've ever worked with leather, you know that it takes time to work it. And especially if you're going to weave it together in such a way that it's going to do some physical damage when you use it. This was not an in-the-moment, immediate reaction. Between verse 14 and 15, there's a significant amount of time that Jesus took to sit and think about what he was about to do. And the reason that I say that this is a great example to find freedom in the allowance for anger is that we know Jesus never what? Sinned. Ooh. <laughs> Jesus never what? Sin. There we go. Woo. All right. I was questioning the job I'm doing. <laughs> Jesus never sinned, which means nothing about his reaction here was sinful. Not one bit of it. But also, he dealt with it then and there. He didn't respond completely out of emotion, but he still dealt with it. The reason that he dealt with it is because letting your anger fester and avoiding confrontation just makes things worse. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 27. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. Jesus sets the example that we can't respond purely out of emotion, but Paul helps us to understand that we have to process and deal with the emotion of anger in a healthy way. Now, sometimes that means having conversations that make us uncomfortable. Other times, that means bringing down the hammer or whipping people. That's what we see in verse 25 in Matthew 18. But immediately after, we also see something else. If you look at verses 26 and 27, At this the servant fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. So in those two verses, we see remorse on the part of the servant. But we know the end of the story. 
We see mercy on the part of the king. But we know the end of the story. Verse 28, that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. Now, I know that there are some people that you just want to choke. I get it. I have them too. They're on a list. Not really. It's more of a scroll. We can't lose sight of the fact, though, that everyone needs forgiveness at some point. We can't lose sight of that. And that's the third reason why forgiveness is hard. People don't appreciate the forgiveness they've been given. The rest of this passage in Matthew gives us the account of what happens as a result of this servant's unappreciative attitude toward the king's forgiveness. The very simple takeaway here is that if we want to be forgiven, we have to be willing to forgive. So now I want to go back to the beginning of the passage and deal with a problem that is probably a bigger issue than most people would want to admit or realize. It's the problem of always and never. See, in the problem of always and never, there are two extremes that have to be addressed. And they have to be addressed because forgiveness is serious business. So when I say it's a problem of always and never, it's really a problem of always people and never people. So let's start with the always people. The always people are the people who are always being forgiven for something and not by the same person over and over all the time, but by different people constantly. Always people are habitual repeat offenders. That means you keep doing the same stupid thing over and over and over and over and over again. Now, they might express remorse or even apologize but they keep going back to behaviors and actions and attitudes that harm other people. And that lands them back in the place where they need to be forgiven again. And in doing this, they take Matthew 18, 22, 70 times 7. They take that as a license or a freedom to say and do whatever they want regardless of the impact that it might have on others. And that puts them in the position where they always need to be forgiven. Now, on the other hand, we have the never people. Never people are those who believe that they never need to be forgiven because they're never wrong. They find themselves offering forgiveness to people for things that those people never did. Never people have this idea that they have somehow arrived. Their intelligence and way of thinking is far superior to the people around them and their behaviors are so beyond or above reproach or question that it's unthinkable that they could be the one in the wrong in any given situation. Never people and always people are very often the same people. And they don't realize it. And this always and never problem continues because of the three things that we've already talked about. So people don't want to be held accountable. 
Always and never people tend to avoid relationships that require accountability. And before I go any further, I hope that you're writing this stuff down because I'm not talking about always and never people so that we can look around the room and point fingers at each other. I'm talking about always and never people so we can write stuff down and start pointing fingers at ourselves. So always and never people tend to avoid relationships that require accountability. They don't have many or any deep connections or long-lasting relationships. They frequently take offense to people holding them accountable for their words and actions, and their response is to withdraw from the relationship. But people don't want to be confrontational. That's the second thing. So always and never people can be hard to deal with. Our general aversion to conflict enables always and never people to continue being always and never people without consequence. Look, you're probably going to lose a friend or two when you, start holding a pe- when you start holding people accountable and confronting offense. But the freedom you and hopefully the person who has offended you will find in dealing with this stuff far outweighs the risk of potentially losing the relationship because the relationship's not a healthy one anyway. People don't appreciate the forgiveness they've been given. Always and never people are usually either blind to the offense they've caused or so self-absorbed that they don't realize how difficult it can be for some people to confront offense and hold you accountable. They also don't give a whole lot of thought to how their words and actions impact other people. So, 70 times 7 is not intended to be this unending vicious cycle of offend, forgive, repeat. It's a call to a higher standard. It's a deeper level of accountability and a genuine concern for the people around you. It's an invitation to authentic relationship with other people and with God. See, just like our relationships with people are not intended to be that dysfunctional cycle, neither is our relationship with God. So if you find yourself constantly on your face begging God to forgive you for the same thing over and over and over again, you need to check your heart. A genuine encounter and real relationship with the living God will produce change in your life. I'm going to repeat that for the people in the back. Not that it's really, that's not what I mean, sorry. My apologies. See, look, I've offended. We forgive. Great, wonderful. That was terrible. But a real encounter and a genuine relationship with God will produce change in your life. If you're not changing as a result of your relationship with Christ... You have some serious questions to ask about your relationship with Christ. It will produce change. Now, that might be a process. It might be a process that is years long, depending on what it is that needs to change. But change will happen. And not only will it happen, you will have a desire to change. You will not be content being the person that you've always been when God calls you to be a new creation in Christ. 
You will not be content living life the way you have always lived life when God calls you and purchases life more abundantly for you. You will want to change because in the change is real prosperity, spiritual, life-giving prosperity in Christ. And the Spirit of God at work within you draws you closer and closer to Him and forms you more and more and more into His likeness. Change will happen and you will have a desire for it to happen if you have a relationship with Him. And that's the part we have to stop on for just a minute. If you have a relationship with with him. Now I will be the first person to tell you that as followers of Christ, as Christians, as people of the body, people in the church, we are not, none of us, in a position to assess your salvation. We're not. Now I can look at the fruit you're producing and we can go back to that scripture reference and talk about the fruit that your life is producing. And I can make an educated guess about where I think you're standing with God, but ultimately, your relationship with God is exactly that. It's your relationship with God. And so, it's between you and Him. And so, whatever anybody else has to say or interject or or push on you about their ideas of what your relationship is, don't listen. Take it to God himself. Take it to God himself. But when you start asking God questions like, how's our relationship? You better be ready for the answer. Because when you ask God honest questions, you can guarantee yourself that you're going to get some honest answers. And you might not always like what he says. But if you're in a real relationship with him, you're going to want to change. You're going to want to change. See, here's the thing. The forgiveness you and I have been offered through Christ was far too costly for us to live unappreciative lives. It's far too costly for us to live lives that are steeped in a cycle of offense and unforgiveness. And if I find myself looking inward and going, oh man, I'm an always, or Huh, I'm a never. Who'd have thought? There's work to be done. But not only is there work to be done, there's probably damage to repair. There's probably damage to repair between you and other people. There's probably, and unfortunately, damage to repair between the church you represent and the people who surround it. So here's, here's a little nugget. If you call this church your home church and you let people know that, whether you like it or not, when you go out those doors, if you're a card-carrying, tattooed on my forehead, life song member, and you go out there and you act a fool and you say stuff that nobody ever ought to say and you treat people like garbage, not only are people making a judgment call about you, but they're making a judgment call 
about us. And that's not a hypothetical, this probably happens. I get phone calls, folks. I'm not kidding. I get phone calls from people who want to tell me about how my church members have done them wrong. And my first question is, well, have you talked to them about it? And generally, the answer is no. Now, I will tell you this. If you call Life Song home, whatever our relationship is and whatever conversation we have, look, I'm going to take that at face value and I'm going to trust your word over any weirdo stranger who calls me randomly. All right? But also, if there's merit to what they say, oh, we're going to have to have an honest conversation. And you might not like it. But, remember, if you're in a relationship with God, you're going to want to change. The forgiveness that we have all been afforded in Christ was far too costly to live life caught up in all that. Now the forgiveness that you and I have been offered and afforded through Jesus Christ that is completion and perfection in forgiveness. I want you to stand with me today. As we get ready to close, I want to bring this stuff home. Because here's the deal. If you've looked at yourself over these last few minutes and gone, I'm an always, or I'm a never, or a never always and an always never, or any combination of those things. Or you've just identified something where you go, I really need to work on this. This is not a beat yourself over the head, beat yourself up, cower in shame revelation for you. This is one step closer to the freedom that we're called to live in and offered in Christ. This is a part of that God-driven desire to change and become more like him. This is not a there's no hope place. This is a I'm still breathing so God can still change me kind of place to be. And if you're still breathing and the revelation you had today was, I don't have a relationship with him. I don't even know what that means. Today is a perfect day to start one. What it means is that the greatest miracle of all miracles is for you. What it means is that every offense you've ever committed that puts you in opposition to God and distance you from God is covered by the forgiveness offered you in Jesus. What a relationship with God, what a relationship with Jesus means is that he knew all of the jacked up stuff you were going to do and all the terrible choices you were going to make and just how big of a turd you were going to be to other people. And just like he looked on those money changers in the temple, he looked on your life and some of that stuff actually might have made him angry, but it did not diminish his love for you in any way. And I know that as a 100% verifiable fact. I know that it's a verifiable fact 
because the word of God is trustworthy. It is true. It is never changing. And the word of God says that Christ loved you so much that he gave himself up unto death that you might be forgiven, that you might be made right with God, that you might be purchased with his blood. That is the cost of the forgiveness that you and I have been afforded. And it's offered to you freely today. And if he can offer that so freely, then all the petty stuff that we hold against one another, we can do better in offering forgiveness in those things as well. Forgiveness, guys, at any level, I believe, is an everyday miracle. Because God moves in mighty ways when there is forgiveness. So as we move into prayer and back into a short time of worship as we close things out today, these altars are open and you are invited to come. And if you just need God to move on your heart and in your mind and show you where you need to course correct and make amends, then you can come and do it here and we'll come and pray around you and over you. And if you're in that place where you're like, I have no idea what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. But today I know I need it. And we'll meet with you here as well. And we'll help you take that first step today. Would you pray with me, church? Father, we thank you for your presence in this place, for the power of your spirit at work within us and around us here today. God, we thank you that even when our flesh is weak and unwilling, God, if we, will just, if we will just stop and let you work. God, you will make a way where there was no other way. God, you will bring reconciliation. You will bring peace. You will bring hope. You will bring love. You will bring life back to relationships. You will restore our hearts, renew our minds, and transform us from the inside out. God, today help us understand that being people of God, people of the cross, people of the church means being people of forgiveness. And God, help us have hearts like yours. Holy Spirit, we invite you now to move in this place to have your way to work in every circumstance and situation how only you can move. We thank you for what you've done here and continue to do in these moments. We praise you and love you and thank you in the name of Jesus.